Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and part two in our series on the world in 1492, in which we will be discussing Native American societies on the eve of European discovery. Now it's often said that history is written by the victors and few groups in American history have been so beaten down and defeated as the Native Americans, meaning that they have been in some cases eradicated from American history, completely overlooked. In other cases, their existence is perpetuated only by primitive stereotypes of the Native Americans as simple savages or the noble savage, the, the happy Indian. Um, at times, their religions have been mocked and dismissed. At other times, historians have uh, completely overlooked the possibility that Native Americans could have constructed the impressive structures and cities that archaeologists have uncovered. Of course, none of these things are true, and the reality is that, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, the Americas were populated by a multitude of rich, diverse cultures on the eve of European settlement. We concluded the previous lecture with this map, which gives just a small taste of the number and diversity of cultures that existed uh, in North America. As many as 2,000 uh, different languages and 600 or so distinct societies existed at that time, uh, many of them with varying degrees of highly developed civilization and culture to rival what we saw in Europe and other parts of the world at that time, an issue that we'll tackle in the next lecture. For the moment, in this lecture, we're going to focus on that diversity in Indian cultures uh, at the time of European discovery. Uh, and we'll talk about some, some different aspects in society that distinguished one Indian group from another. So as I mentioned, the defining characteristic and difference amongst these cultures was language. This is usually the way that scholars and archaeologists have tried to kind of piece together uh, what differentiated one group from another. And again, there may have been as many as 2,000 different language groups and thus 2,000 different groups uh, in the Americas at that time. The population and number of uh, Native Americans is under much dispute. Of course, it's really impossible uh, for us to know and decipher how many Indians there might have been in the Americas uh, at that time. Uh, but estimates range about 75 million uh, Indians in all of the Americas at the time of European discovery. Most of those, of course, in South America or the Caribbean. Um, but about 700,000 uh, living on the eastern seaboard around that time. And of course, again, there's much dispute about that. Um, so language, the key defining difference amongst these cultures um, related to that was the ability to write and different forms of communication. Some of them uh, had developed fairly sophisticated uh, written language uh, along the lines of hieroglyphics of the ancient Egyptians. Others, uh, as far as we know, had no uh, ability to communicate through written language. Uh, artistic expression varied widely uh, across these different societies, along with means of survival. And again, this becomes one of the, the defining sort of differences amongst these different groups. Did they survive by hunting? Did they survive by farming? Uh, or some combination of both. Continuing with uh, the differences and diversity in these cultures. Uh, economy. Some of them uh, evolved robust trading economies. We'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. Others had really no semblance of what we might even call an economy, no currency or trade or anything like that. Um, in some cases, they had uh, very sophisticated calendars and understandings of uh, time and the passage of time. And in other cases, we have no evidence uh, that they uh, really thought that much about it. Uh, and similarly, there's a, a vast array of uh, religion, myths, rituals, stories. There are some common threads that, uh, that connect many of these cultures together, um, but there are also a lot of differences 
um, across the many, many cultures at that time. Again, much diversity in terms of things like housing, the size of towns, villages, uh, and cities, and architecture. These things are all kind of related to each other. In some cases, you're talking about very temporary housing, uh, if any at all. Uh, some of them threw up very um, mobile uh, and easily constructed and deconstructed forms of housing like teepees or tents, uh, things that could be quickly um, put together as they tended to follow the herds. In other cases, what you see on the screen are more permanent settlements, in some cases, very permanent settlements. Um, and again, in, in some cases, very uh, highly developed forms of uh, construction and architecture, as you see uh, here in the cliff dwellings in the lower part of this picture. You see a wide array of difference in terms of manner of dress. And again, this relates to many of the factors we've talked about above. How much did they move around? How much were they static? What was the weather and the climate like? What kind of resources were there? What did they make their clothes from? So in some cases you see very uh, kind of heavy clothing made out of heavy skins like bear skins. In other cases you might see deer skins or uh, smaller game rabbit furs and in some cases very little clothing at all. Again, a wide array of music and other forms of culture. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and there is difference in terms of whether these societies were matriarchal uh, or patriarchal, meaning did they kind of trace their lineage through uh, the mother or did they trace their lineage through the father. So let's look at a few images and just think about what do we mean by this, uh, these differences across society. And I'll encourage you as we look at a few of these pictures just to imagine or think for yourself where these various people might uh, be located and what were their lives like. So as we look at this first example, the Maka Indians, I'll pause for just a few moments and let you think about and imagine based on what you see in this picture, where did these people live and how did they survive? Well, there are lots of different ways you might think about this. You can imagine, obviously, somewhere near the water, right? The Great Lakes region, perhaps, or uh, the eastern parts of what is today Canada. Uh, the answer, actually, is the Pacific Northwest um, today, what, the area around Seattle and, and northern Washington state. These were known as the people of the salmon. They migrated uh, with the salmon and hunted largely in the seas. They hunted fish, seals, uh, and whales. Now, similarly, some of you may know the answer or might have seen images uh, like this of the Anasazi uh, Pueblo Mojave uh, Indians. They lived, of course, in the North American West in the desert. Um, very dry climate, kind of scratching out an existence, um, surviving near whatever rivers or, or water sources might have been there. Uh, and they tended to hunt game such as bison, uh, developing tactics like driving the game uh, over cliffs to, uh, to harvest them that way. This image represents Cahokia, uh, the Mississippian peoples. This was actually the largest settlement north of Mexico at that time, uh, representing a, a city or settlement of some 30,000 people uh, around the time of uh, the arrival of the Europeans. The Cahokians were known to engage in trade. This became a, a significant trading hub uh, right in the middle of North America, around uh, where St. Louis is today. Uh, they traded, you see the Clovis uh, points at the top there, which we talked about in the previous lecture, um, traded various kind of tools and implements. Um, and grew many different crops. So this became a, a highly developed society right in the middle of the country. Then there are the eastern woodland um, populations like the Penobscot, the Iroquois, the Powhatans. And we're going to be talking much more about uh, these groups as they were uh, located right at the site of European settlement in the east 
and there are a number of uh, relationships and confrontations between these groups and the European settlers. Uh, you might gather from what you see in the picture, these um, tended to be migratory people. Again, you see the housing easily um, put up and, and taken down. Uh, they tended to follow game. They uh, hunted beaver and other small animals, moose, um, bear, and deer, but also uh, engaged in farming at times as well. So this is one of those populations kind of in between um, migratory and permanently settled. And our last example here, the Calusan Indians. And I'll pause for just a moment and let you imagine where they might be located. Well, if you look at the picture carefully, you see lots of different forms of uh, marine life that they are hunting and kind of snaring with traps. These tended to live in South Florida today, living uh, along the waters, hunting uh, rays and fish, sometimes even whales uh, or seals, and then gathering whatever roots and berries and other uh, food they might find along the coast. So there are many, many other examples we could look at in a lecture like this. I'm going to leave it there for now and just take with you the theme, many rich, diverse cultures uh, in the Americas at the time of European settlement. In our next lecture, we're going to look at some commonalities uh, that existed between these civilizations and also think about uh, the Europeans who arrived and what their lives were like.